Uh, yes, welcome to a lecture on XR accessibility. I'm really pleased to be here. Glad uh, Dr. Han was able to, to get a hold of us. Uh, my name is Dylan Fox. I'm the head of community and outreach at XR Access. Uh, I also research augmented reality for people with low vision at UC Berkeley. Uh, you can contact me at dylan at uh, drfoxdesign.com. So what I'm going to talk to you about today, uh, since I believe we've got the full hour, um, is first just a brief overview of the XR Access Initiative, what we do. Um, second, we're going to talk about what is XR accessibility and why does it matter. Uh, third, we're going to talk about the principles of accessible design. Uh, then we're going to talk about XR assistive technology, and we'll cover the distinction between those two in a bit. Uh, then we're going to talk a little bit about the ethics of accessibility. Uh, and finally, I'm going to give you some XR accessibility resources uh, for your own coding pleasure. <laughs> um, and then some Q&A, hopefully, if we've got some time. So starting with the XR Access Initiative. So we are uh, an organization founded in 2019 uh, to engage, connect, and influence the field of XR uh, in order to make XR inclusive of all, regardless of abilities. Um, we have a really firm vision of uh, accessible design being a core part um, of all XR applications. Um, we want to make sure that that inclusivity is part of that kind of minimum viable product. It's not, you know, an afterthought that you come back to later. Uh, we want to make sure that resources on how to make things accessible in XR are widespread and up to date. I want to make sure that people with disabilities are part of these solutions, defining these futures and not just kind of passively experiencing them. Um, and we want to make sure that we consider intersectionality. We know there's, in addition to any number of different combinations of disabilities, um, people's other characteristics, right? Uh, skin color, age, uh, gender, sexuality, all of these can make an impact on accessibility. Uh, and on the, the ability of this technology to benefit everyone. Um, so we cater to a really wide variety of groups. We're, we're trying to make sure that all of the different people that need to come together in order to solve this really challenging problem are in the same room. Um, and thus we talk to researchers, uh, end users, application and content creators, uh, platforms, products and associations, uh, policymakers, educators, and employers, and consultants, and really just everybody who is interested in either you know, using XR to, to boost entertainment or productivity or any other reason, um, and the, the big community of people with disabilities that don't want to get left behind by another technology. So with that out of the way, let's talk uh, a little bit about what is XR accessibility and why does it matter? Why, sh why should you care about it? Um, so to do that, first we're gonna define XR and then we're gonna define accessibility. So XR, as I'm sure probably most of you in, in the uh, this class are aware, uh, stands for extended reality. Um, and so that is basically a mixture of immersive technologies. You have virtual reality in which digitally generated immersive experiences are accessed via head mounted displays or a web browser. Uh, you have augmented reality in which digitally augmented experiences are rendered as an overlay on the user's field of view. Uh, and you have mixed reality where there is this merging of the physical and digital worlds to produce experiences where both physical and digital objects can coexist in one 3D space. And altogether those make XR. So that's what XR is. What is accessibility? Accessibility means that something is usable regardless of ability. And now when a lot of people think about accessibility, they think only about access for people with permanent disabilities, you know, people who are maybe permanently wheelchair users uh, or fully blind or amputees or what have you. But one of the reasons that accessibility is so important is that disability comes in all forms. It comes in permanent, but also temporary and situational forms. Um, and the accessibility adjustment that you make to something to make it more accessible to somebody who's you know, permanently deaf is also going to be more accessible to someone who's deaf because of an ear infection, you know, temporarily deaf, or somebody who's in a, a really crowded and noisy bar you know, who's situationally deaf. So remember that 
all everything we're talking about in this presentation about accessibility that isn't just applying to some group over here that's applying to you and everyone else you know because anytime that you can't devote your full you know body and mental capabilities to piloting an application you are at least partially disabled so i'd like to to pause here for a brief discussion because i don't just want to have this be me you know talking at you guys for an hour uh, when have each of you experienced a temporary or situational disability and i open it up to the class Is everyone just frozen? So, um, hi, I don't know if you can see the back of my head. I wear glasses. If I lose them, that is situational disability, and I'm screwed until I find them again. Absolutely. We've had no broken bones in the classroom. Uh, I've got I've sprained both of, both of my shoulders to a point where I couldn't use one arm or the other for, you know, four to six weeks. Not great. How, how about this? Have any of you wanted to use your smartphone, but you had both hands full? There you go. You're situationally disabled because your hands are busy cooking. You got to have another way to interact with that phone, right? So I think all of us, if we, if we take a moment to think about it, have been in situations like those and, and are in situations like those every day. Um, and the reason that's important is because of something called the curb cut effect. So the curb cut effect, this is uh, reason number one of three why XR accessibility is important. Um, curb cuts are exactly what they sound like. They are ramps cut into sidewalk curbs to let people in wheelchairs cross the street more easily. Uh, and disabled advocates like Jack Fisher and Ed Roberts uh, had to fight tooth and nail to get these curb cuts installed, at which point everybody realized, oh, you know, this is actually a good idea, <laughs> which right there is the, the history of accessibility advocacy in a nutshell. Um, but everybody realized, oh, this is a good idea because the curb cuts that were made for people in wheelchairs also benefited people with bicycles or suitcases or strollers or dollies or any number of other things. Uh, and thus the, the curb cut effect is basically shorthand to say that when we design for people with disabilities, we make things better for everyone. And the curb cut effect fully applies in VR uh, because take the example of picking things up off the ground in virtual reality. You know, it's possible if you're able-bodied, it's just kind of awkward, right? You have to like kind of lean over, pick up the thing, hope that your headset isn't gonna fall forward off your head, you know, all that. Um, but when you realize that people with motor disabilities can't do that, right? Not everybody is going to be able to, to bend over and pick something off the floor. Uh, and you decide to look for new solutions, you're going to find something that's a better experience for everybody. Uh, and so, for example, in Half-Life Alex, uh, you have the gravity gloves, which lets you grab objects with a flick of your wrist. Um, which not only helps, you know, the people with motor disabilities uh, to interact with the objects in the game, but it makes it so much better for everybody and makes you feel like a Jedi, right? So these types of solutions, you think there's a little bit of creativity, you don't settle for, oh, well, this will work for most of our users. You'll really find that you find better solutions for all of your users. A second reason that it's important is equitable access. Um, and so the idea here is that XR technologies are offering some really amazing capabilities for jobs, education, socialization, and just any number of other purposes. Um, training especially is a really huge use case with <laughs> groups from electricians to doctors to Walmart greeters uh, using VR to prepare for new situations because it just helps us get ready for things in a way that screens and pamphlets don't. Um, we see that on, on the left here with uh, a line worker, I believe, in, uh, in Britain getting ready to, to do some virtual training. Um, and accessibility then is the difference between people with disabilities falling even further behind 
or being able to use these tools to help catch up. Uh, so for example, social isolation is something that threatens a lot of people with disabilities. Uh, and in the social sp VR space, VR chat, there's a big deaf community that has been using hand tracking controllers to sign to one and to teach sign language to other people. Um, because, you know, when VR came out, this was the first time that there were lots of people with six degree of freedom controllers uh, who can meet up in this, these kind of virtual spaces and communicate with one another in their, their native tongue um, or native sign, so to speak, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, now that said, I will say that uh, other deaf folks have told me that that this type of signing where you only have kind of like mittens on your hands a little bit is kind of like trying to talk with your mouth full of marbles. So there's still a long way to go in terms of having perfect sign language recognition. Yeah. Um, but this is just an example of a way that VR can serve to help support equity instead of to, to be another tool against it. And the final reason that I'll touch on today that XR accessibility is really important is because it unlocks new capabilities. Um, when you make things accessible for humans, oftentimes you are also making them accessible for machines. Right, and the case in point here is we're looking at a, a screenshot from Alt Space VR, which is another social VR uh, space. Um, and when Microsoft went in and did all of the legwork in terms of you know text recognition, rendering, um, localization, all the stuff to to be able to present captions in a VR space, they found that they were effectively kind of one API call away from also having translations, real-time language translation, um, which makes this huge opportunity for kind of international socializing. Um, and so you'll, you'll see that in a lot of ways, right? When you add alternate text to an image on your website, you're making it accessible to blind folks, but you're also making it accessible to Google search bots. So an image that's full of alt, uh, a website that's full of alt text is going to have way better uh, SEO, search engine optimization, than one without. So really, when people talk about, oh, you know, I don't want to invest all of this money into just making things accessible. Remember, you're not just making things accessible. You're also preparing all of these new capabilities that you'll be able to implement now that your text is, now that your your application is kind of properly formatted to be able to communicate across a variety of devices. Um, and one other thing I want to talk about before we kind of jump into the principles of accessible design um, is this idea that there's two different kind of perspectives on XR accessibility. Um, the first is making this core XR hardware and software accessible, right? That's the idea that any application that uses XR should be accessible by everybody. We don't want to have here's the you know million applications that anyone can use, and here's the uh, you know five applications that people who are blind can use. That's not equitable. That's not good. Um, but the second way that you can look at XR accessibility is in the idea of XR as assistive technology. And this is the idea that there are a lot of capabilities uh, that XR has in terms of all of these new sensors, all these new form factors um, that can enable us to build XR tech that's focused uh, on making products specifically for people with disabilities um, in order to improve their quality of life, their standard of living. Um, and in XR access, well, we tend to be focused on the former. We really encourage both. Uh, and we also really support inclusive co-design where you're actively involving people with disabilities to explore both of these dimensions uh, and to advance the overall possibilities of XR. So with that said, let's talk about some examples of accessible design. Um, so first I'm gonna give you some principles that kind of apply to accessibility across the board. Uh, and then we're going to talk about uh, accessibility in terms of specific kind of senses and capabilities like vision, uh, hearing, and so on. So the first principle I want to talk to you about, and this is going to help connect all of these examples, is the idea of modularity, right? So modularity means the ability to kind of mix and match parts of a system. Um, and this is important because when we use technology, we get input from a device, we make a decision about what we want to do, and then we output our commands to it. So for example, you might get an input of a phone alert with a text from your friend. 
and the output would be to tap on the message to open it, right? And then you get a new input in the form of the contents of that message and a new output in the form of the response that you text them back. Um, and the key to making this accessible is to make sure that there are multiple ways to get that input and multiple ways to give that output, right? So, you know, blind people can't get input through their vision. Uh, and they also tend to have trouble giving output through touch that, you know, doesn't have anything else to go with it. Um, but this is where modularity comes in, right? If the text messaging app can mix and match different kinds of inputs like text-to-speech and different kinds of outputs like Bluetooth keyboards, then there's no problem. Because at that point, the way that somebody is ac uh, accessing the technology might look totally different, but the function remains the same. So that's modularity. The second uh, principles I'm going to lay on you here is the web content accessibility guidelines uh, poor principles. And these are some of the kind of standard definitions that you'll find if you look up accessibility. Um, the first one is perceivable. Second is operable. Third is understandable. And fourth is robust. And for perceivable, question is, can users perceive the system, right? So if you have an image that has no alternate text, blind people aren't going to be able to perceive that. Uh, second question is operable. Can users operate on the system? So if you have, you know, an app where the only way to move forward in it is to, to use your mouse and click on a tiny box in the center, a lot of people won't be able to, to do that operation. Uh, third is understandable. Uh, can users understand the system? And this tends to go with Things like um, if you're changing your navigation on every page, that's going to be really hard for people to understand. They can't build up a concept of here's how this application works uh, in a consistent way. It's not going to be understandable. Uh, and then the fourth is robust. So is the system robust to a variety of user agents, which really just means does it work for a lot of different web browsers? Does it work for a lot of different screen readers? Uh, and in this case, does it work for you know, on mobile and web and a headset, right? It needs to be robust across all of these different modes of use. Uh, and then the final principle before we get into the, the accessible design samples, is this idea of nothing about us without us. Um, now you'll learn a lot about accessibility in presentations like this. And if you take courses on accessibility, but there is no substitute for talking directly with disabled people and incorporating their lived experience into your design development and testing. Um, you know, you may know a lot of things, you may even know some of the like underlying technology and all of that, but if any type of process doesn't involve actually bringing in people with disabilities and getting their feedback directly, ideally having them on your team from the start, having them as CEOs, as designers, as developers, you're not gonna be accessible. Uh, so let me get a quick drink of water, and then we can talk about accessibility techniques in action. Um, any questions on on what we've covered so far? All right, we'll keep moving then. So talking about accessibility uh, in terms of specific senses, you'll see a lot of, uh, this, this pattern emerged a lot, but what you want to do for vision, for example, is make things both easier to see for people that have some vision and provide alternatives to, see, to sight for people that have no vision at all, right? So for vision, that means using legible fonts, um, using high contrast elements, um, making things just nice and big and legible. Um, and for people that can't see at all, you need to have alternatives to vision, which is usually going to be alternate text. Um, so for example, here we have, you know, a, a picture of a dog and the alt text would describe that image to you, you know, saying a guide dog looks up attentively saying, this is me pretending to be interested. Uh, and then yawn saying, this is me not pretending. Uh, I thank you all for at least pretending so far. <laughs> um, so. Both of these principles continue to apply when you get to XR. Uh, I'm going to give you an example here um, of a, a really great tool that was created by um, uh, Yuhang Zhao and uh, as well as collaborators at Microsoft and some other folks at Cornell, um, which is this idea of seeing VR. 
Uh, and so this is a Unity plugin that uh, is still kind of a prototype. So I don't know how easy it is to just slap it into apps, but um, this has a number of features for both making things easier to see, right? Like magnification, um, edge enhancement, recoloring, uh, text augmentation, as well as trying to, you know, support folks that can't see it all by offering object descriptions or even uh, AI kind of interpretation of what you're looking at, right? So again, you want to make things easier to see. You want to provide alternatives to sight. Uh, moving on to hearing, you make things easier to hear by offering, uh, you know, things like different sliders for different types of sound, right? If somebody may have a hard time making out dialogue, uh, you want to let them put the dialogue up to max and everything else down to zero, right? So they don't have to be trying to filter out all of these other sounds. Uh, and then in terms of alternatives to hearing, well, 90% of the time that is going to be captions. Um, captions are, are really important. One of the single biggest uh, improvements to accessibility you can make. Um, and there's all kinds of, of you know, best practices for those. Um, things like don't use all caps, make sure you have a high contrast background, uh, let users set the size and the font to something that's legible to them, um, include speaker labels, include descriptions. There, there's all these, these good practices for captions. And this is one of those things that still applies in XR, but comes with a bunch of new questions, right? So what we're looking at here is uh, Alchemy Labs game Vacation Simulator. And you know when you come to XR, there's questions like, where should your captions go on the screen, considering there's no kind of easy top and bottom? Uh, how do you indicate who's talking? How do you handle occlusion? Because your captions are now potentially kind of objects in the game. Um, and you can see here in this clip, they answer some of those with, uh, there's an icon that depicts the speaker, which in this case is this gardening robot. Uh, there's an arrow that keeps pointing towards the speaker at all times. Uh, and there's a background on the text in order to help improve contrast. Um, now that's not to say these captions are perfect, right? There's still you know a lot of folks that would have trouble with this level of contrast, the size and font of text, et cetera. Um, but it's doing that really important step of taking something that would normally only be accessible to people with hearing uh, and making it accessible to those without. Um, also, again, it features into things like translation and, and localization, right? When you have subtitles, it's that much easier uh, to, to put your game into other languages. Um, so that's hearing. Let's talk about physical disabilities. Uh, for physical disabilities, first you want to make it easier to interact with things. Uh, so, for example, you um, for buttons, you want to have nice large touch targets, right? You don't want to have to have people have to tap some tiny portion of the screen to be able to click your button, um, because that is going to make it really difficult for anybody that might have limited mobility or spastic hand movements or, or anything like that. Um, and it'll also make it easier on people whose mouse is set on a really high sensitivity, right? Things like that. So again, keep in mind, any adjustment you're making for people with disabilities is going to improve it for everybody else as well. Um, and then the big thing for physical is to have alternatives to having to make specific motions or target specific things, right? Um, the, the big one for this uh, is this idea of focus. Um, that is basically saying that I should be able to operate your website or whatever I need to by using no more than two buttons, right? Uh, a tab button to kind of switch where my focus is, what's in focus, you know, what effectively is your, your kind of mouse hovering on, uh, and then one to execute whatever's on that focus, right? Um, and so here we're seeing an example on mobile of what a good focus order might look like. Because when you're using focus, uh, it's important to have it be a sensible order, ideally kind of reading order, right? Left to right, top to bottom. Um, and you want to make sure that it's clear what's in focus, right? It's no good to be able to defocus on different things if it's totally invisible and I don't know what I'm going to be clicking on if I hit enter. Um, and if you can do that, 
it's going to make it much more accessible to people with motor disabilities because at yeah. that point, even somebody who's, you know, say quadriplegic and has nothing but like a, a suck or sip switch uh, can execute on your applications. It's also really important for people who are blind because when you switch the focus, their screen reader is going to reading out what's in focus and let them know when they have the thing they want to, to target. Um, so making sure that you have that idea of focus, that's something that is, I think, yet to be executed in XR. Um, it's the, the subject of some really interesting ongoing research. But thinking about things like that, thinking about uh, what we see on the right here, which is voice commands, right? Alternative inputs that maybe don't require any motion on part of the user at all. Um, things like being able to select via gaze uh, or even brain computer interfaces are, are fascinating new field in this as well. Making sure you have those alternatives to, to having to, to move your hand in a specific way um, is going to be really important for, for improving that accessibility. Now, physical disabilities is another place that gets uh, really challenging in XR because XR and especially virtual reality apps can offer this the ability to play okay. games or do things just like we would in real life, right? So if you're playing a first person shooter, you can aim and shoot and duck and dodge. Um, and that's really exciting, right? Taking away that layer of abstraction and really letting yourself kind of be in the game and do what you would do in real life. That's really cool. And that's, I think, one of the big reasons people are excited about VR. But if that is the only way to play, then you've just excluded a bunch of people from being able to play your game, right? When they, maybe they would have been able to yeah. if you had a normal kind of joystick and button set up. Um, so it's really important to, to make sure that you have kind of the best of both worlds here, right? So what I'm showing here is a tool called Walk-In VR Driver um, that helps to address some of these types of challenges. Uh, so here it's letting this player rotate where he is in this first person shooter without having to physically rotate in real life because you notice he's a wheelchair user to rotate a wheelchair you generally have to you know put your controllers down put your hands on your wheelchair and move it and that's not really feasible when you might have a zombie coming to run at you at any time um, and so instead he can use some button presses to kind of digitally rotate instead uh, and I'll show you what this looks like here in, on, in terms of the functionalities of walk-in VR driver, um, offering things like co-piloting with another person, uh, virtual motion and rotation, so you can move in-game without having to move in real life, um, position adjustment, so you can play while you're seated or lying down or standing up, um, and the ability to track hands, you know, for especially for folks that might have trouble physically holding onto a controller for an extended period of time. All of these types of things are going to be really helpful in making sure that people's physical capabilities uh, aren't a barrier to enjoying these technologies. Uh, next up, we're going to talk briefly about cognitive disability. Now, this in many ways is similar to simply practicing good UX design, uh, because people with cognitive disabilities might have trouble you know, processing too much information all at once or keeping a lot of things in short-term memory. Um, you might get easily confused or frustrated and abandon your application if it's just too difficult to understand. Uh, and if that sounds familiar to you, then some of you may be designers who know that disability or not, anybody who gets too frustrated with an app that isn't easy to use is probably going to stand up and walk away. Um, and so the same things that you do to support somebody who's stressed out or busy or doing anything else that that means they don't have their full kind of cognitive focus to put it on the task, anything you're doing for that is also going to be helping people that uh, have cognitive disabilities. Um, and so that includes things like good tutorials. Um, it includes things like you see here on the left of contextual help options, where rather than front load all of the information at once, you can get help with things as you come across it. Um, and you can see this in XR on the right here with Google Tilt Brush, um, which has a beginner mode. Right? It has a way to, to kind of hide a lot of these commands and just leave you with the bare basic tools that you need to start out. Um, and only once you've learned those and gained some mastery of those and, and not been intimidated by this giant swath of things, you know, what some people might call the, the Photoshop effect. Right? I don't know if you've, any of you have opened up Photoshop for the first time and just gone, 
there's way too many buttons here. <laughs> but offering modes like that, offering tools like that, um, are really going to make it more better for for your people with cognitive disabilities and just better for every single user of the app. Yep. Uh, and then the last um, kind of specific group I'm going to talk about is people with sensory disabilities. Um, and by that, I mean folks that may get easily overstimulated or overwhelmed um, with, you know, from, from just extra stimulation, right? Whether that's uh, videos auto-playing or having lots of flashing animations or sounds that, that you can't turn off, right? So making sure that you have ways to, to limit how much your app is, is putting out in terms of just pure light and sound and touch and other stimuli um, is going to be really helpful for those folks. Um, you can see here on the left, we have an example from Duolingo that lets you just turn off animations. Um, and on the right, there's this is actually a tool called the Photosensitive Epilepsy Analysis Tool. It lets you upload a video clip and see if you're at risk for triggering epileptic seizures, right? Um, so being cautious about that is really important. Um, and that applies double in XR because XR, you know, it's all around you. It can be really easy to, to get overstimulated. Uh, I'm going to play a clip that is um, an example of what not to do, <laughs> right? It's a call from a short film called Hyper Reality. So, if anybody of you feeling that, you know, watching that for another 10 seconds would have given you a migraine, um, just imagine having it be all around you and right next to your face. Um, and the next time you're thinking about putting some kind of like pop up or something else like that in XR, maybe think again about whether you really need it. So let's pause there for a moment and um, have a discussion real quick about what accessibility features have you benefited from? Because uh, I know everybody here has has probably used captions at least uh, once or twice in their life. So let's think what other things that that maybe have put in place for folks with disabilities have helped you? Well, I know that for you know, simple things like playing video games, there's often team colors. I played a couple games where the team colors, I could distinguish between a teammate and an enemy. So I had to do the color line option to change things. Otherwise the game would have been played. Absolutely. When I'm watching a video and I can't have the sound on, like I'm in public or something, so having captions is useful for me. It's nice to be able to just turn off um, sound on apps, even if you're just like in public or the sound's really annoying. Yep. Another example of uh, situational disability, for sure. My mom is actually deaf, so I kind of grew up on captions. So now I almost prefer them. Like, oh, look at well, what's going on, what's happening, what people are saying. When you're driving, um, the Google Map option is to do it versus watching it, watching the map. Absolutely, and I'll also say things like um, automatic doors. Uh, things like audiobooks. Uh, if you've used either of those, you're benefiting from an accessibility feature. Awesome. Anybody have any other suggestions before we move on? Maybe home assistants, such as like Siri or Google, just you can speak to it so that you can interact. Uh, so it's pretty nice. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the, the AI tools, it, it's funny. There's papers that imagine the smart home, you know, going back to the 60s and earlier. Um, and a lot in the context of if you can't turn your lights on and off, if you can't open your windows, wouldn't it be great to have something to do it for you? And lo and behold, it turns out even the people that can still enjoy that those capabilities. 
Awesome. Well, let's go ahead and keep moving on. Um, the next section I think I want to talk about is this idea of XR assistive technology, um, because this is a really, really fascinating field with lots of really interesting applications. There's so many people uh, in academia that have been taking kind of every technology as, as far back as you can think and saying, well, could this be used, used to help people? Could this be used to help people? Um, and there's some really just interesting highlights I wanted to, to bring up with you today. But first, before we get on to the examples, uh, I want to say a word about disability dongles. Uh, a disability dongle is an elegant and well-intended but ultimately useless solution uh, to a problem people with disabilities never knew they had. Um, and the, the poster child for this is sign language translation gloves. Um, you can look, Google it, and find any number of, you know, very well-meaning but kind of misguided engineers um, that have decided, ah, here's a problem we can solve with technology, um, kind of dove into it without really asking anybody in the deaf community um, and then go, aha, look, we've solved this problem. Um, sometimes get rewards from other able-bodied people and then the, the disabled community rolls its eyes and says, oh, not again. <laughs> because in this example, um, yes, you might be able to take single hand shapes and translate those into unique letters, but sign language doesn't really work like that. Sign language has just so many different variations, so many aspects of it that rely not just on what the hands are doing, but on the hands in relationship to the body and your face and kind of emotional expression. Um, you can't make a pair of gloves alone that can fully translate sign language. Uh, and the, the point here is that anytime you're working with assistive technology, get people with disabilities involved, get the people that you're trying to help uh, involved at the very earliest stage you can, you know, run your ideas past them before you build a single darn thing, um, because otherwise you might make a disability dongle. Uh, another another great example of this is uh, these types of stairs. I don't know if, if any of you have seen these pop up as examples of, oh, what beautiful thinking and, and innovation for accessibility. These don't work. Um, there's no handrails. They're too steep. Uh, there's all of these weird angles in them where you're stepping off the bottom of a stair onto a, like a ramp, uh, which is terrible for low vision. Um, there's very little in the way of kind of landings that you can use to, to turn around. Um, this is one of those types of things where some architect thought, hmm, I know. I know how to make this successful. I'm not going to bother asking anybody that uses a wheelchair. I'll just kind of go ahead and pour the concrete. Um, and it's really not what you want to be doing. So check with those, those disabled people before you construct anything. <laughs> that being said, uh, let's look at some of these, these applications because they're really interesting. Um, first one I want to talk about, and we just got five here just to, to run through to give you new, kind of an example of what AR is being used for. Uh, this one is treating phantom limb pain with AR therapy. Um, so the idea here is that folks who have lost a limb uh, often have pain from the, the phantom limb uh, that it's very difficult to do anything about. Um, but turns out you put patients, uh, you give patients a, a representation of their phantom limb on video. Um, you put some electrodes and computer vision to let them effectively control the phantom limb by using their muscles. Uh, let them use their lost limb to complete rehabilitation exercises and play rehabilitation games. Um, and you can cut that pain almost in half um, with long-term effects that lasted six months, you know, after the, the last treatment. Um, so really awesome application. Uh, number two is the tele-rehabilitation system, Ghost Man. Um, this is from a 2014 paper uh, by uh, Chintamit et al. I'm pronouncing that right, I hope. Um, where a patient and a therapist in different locations each wear a headset, um, and each of them views this kind of ghost-like image of the other that they can try to match. And so the idea here is that um, you know if you're trying to do some type of rehabilitation exercise, uh, or in this case, you know, learn how to use chopsticks, for example. 
um, you can get this kind of first person view of what you should be doing rather than having somebody you know on a video or across a table that you're trying to, to mirror uh, and should it, you know to be just as effective as face-to-face -face destruction in terms of reduction in skill error uh, and improvement in completion time so really really interesting opportunity there uh, third one here is the idea of social communication aids for individuals uh, on the autism spectrum. Um, this is basically the idea of uh, kind of gamifying an experience to teach children um, with uh, autism to focus on faces and to recognize emotions. Um, that's something that it can be very challenging to do for kids with autism, kids with severe ADHD. Um, I will note these are, are by no means perfect. I think there's a lot of criticism on these types of things in terms of trying to force people who are neuro neurodiverse to kind of pretend to be neurotypical instead of addressing the practices that, you know, the discrimination that they face for being neurodiverse in the first place. Um, but that being said, uh, still showed some significant improvements in irritability, hyperactivity, and social withdrawal for uh, some of the, the kids that use this. Um, similar treatments used for things like job training in adults as well. Uh, you know, AR interfaces that can remind you to look at somebody's eyes or remind you to, to modulate your volume if you're being too loud or too soft. Um, really, so really, really fascinating training applications. Uh, number four is this remote interpretation system called Chat in the Hat, um, which I'm going to be honest, I chose half for just the paper title. <laughs> Uh, the idea here is that, uh, you know, when you are a um, deaf person relying on a sign language interpreter, um, it can be really costly to hire a, a interpreter to, you know, walk around with you and uh, kind of help out over the course of the day, right? Um, and so the idea here is that uh, with this chat in the hat system, you effectively have cameras and video displays and microphones that uh, enable a hearing person to talk to, to the deaf person, uh, the sound goes into the microphone, the remote interpreter who's you know on Zoom or whatever, um, can then interpret that into sign language. The deaf person sees that on a little display that they have. Um, they can sign back, which goes back through the interpreter and then the interpreter speaks through a little speaker on the cap. Um, I thought this was really, really awesome application. I think obviously there's there's a lot of logistical challenges that come with this. You'll see a lot of these systems are, are you know, kind of prototypes or Wizard of Oz, but um, this this type of capability to have either AI or human assistance uh, that is kind of mounted into these wearable equipment, uh, I think is really fascinating. And there's there's a lot of opportunities for for thinking like this as we move forward. Uh, last one I'm going to show, and this one is, is kind of near and dear to my part, is the idea of AR scene sonification and guidance for blind people. Um, and so this relies on the idea that uh, augmented reality headsets like the HoloLens are very good um, at capturing both imagery uh, as well as being able to make 3D environmental maps of your surroundings. Um, and we can use those to help guide people with low vision and, and navigation and uh, you know obstacle avoidance. Um, you can lots of different proposals on on ways to do this. I myself just put in a a paper for publication uh, about kind of low vision enhancement, but you can provide um, you know sound guidance. You can have a, a digital avatar, as what you see on the right here. This kind of lozenge shaped thing will kind of float along and say, "Follow me, follow me," and guide people towards their destination. Um, lots of different ways to apply this once we have technology that has a better understanding of our environment. Um, so that's just kind of five examples out of many, 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 many. Um, so I'd, I'd love to pause there and ask you all, uh, what do you think are some unmet needs of people with disabilities that could be solved with XR? I'd love to, to, to hear some, some quick brainstorming here. I've seen before the use of augmented reality headsets or other such devices to like if someone can't be at a specific location, maybe they're in a, in a like you know hospital bed and they want to travel somewhere or meet with someone, 
they kind of like immerse themselves by if there's maybe a small drone or something in the area and they're seeing through those eyes without their own headset. Presence. Absolutely. I don't think I've ever seen AR being used for um, ice tablet health or full visibility. Like um, I've been having uh, some kind of medical um, expert use AR to help, I don't know, people who are who need to have a you know visibility for what able to see or hear. Um, I would like to see what the possibilities are. I don't know what they'll be, but I would like to, I'd like to know what um, those persons would say they would want, to, how they would like to be served with an application like that. Yeah, no, that, that's very good. I think the, the, again, ability to have somebody kind of piggyback and see what you see and then being able to support you at range uh, is, is something I think we really only begin to scratch the surface up when it comes to assistive technology. Anybody else? I, I'd love to, uh, what, one good source of inspiration here is uh, if any of you have day-to-day uh, -day experiences with, with old people, right? Maybe you're, you're, grandparents uh, or anybody else that that uh, is suffering kind of age-related disability, even if they don't necessarily think of themselves as disabled, right? We all tend to slow down as we get older. We all tend to, to start to lose vision and hearing. Um, what are some problems that those folks have that maybe could be supported with, uh, with XR technology? So, um... I actually follow tons of accessibility research. One interesting thing that I've seen recently that could be adapted to XR is um, the long-term stability of procedural memory and tying that into routine tasks for people with declining cognitive health. And that's something that could super be adapted to XR. Absolutely. Yeah. I've read some very interesting papers on um, various kinds of kind of cognition augmentation uh, where, you know, you have things like step-by-step um, -step instructions for everyday tasks and for folks that maybe start to forget or uh, ways to keep, um, you know, provide folks who have dementia, just little kind of insights into this is who this person is. Um, there, there's lots of opportunities there as well. So that's, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, awesome. So let's let's go ahead and move on. Um, let's see, I don't know how our time is looking. I think we've got, uh, uh, Professor Han, how, mu how much time do we have left? 25 minutes. 25 minutes. Okay, fantastic. Uh, so let's talk a little bit here about the ethics of accessibility. Um, now, ethics are a complex subject, right? I mean, what what is good, what is bad? Um, you'll see here, this is, uh, there, there are a lot of things to consider in ethics, right? This is a diagram that's put together by uh, Kent Bai of the Voices of VR podcast. Um, and as you can see, there are many, many, many challenges that you can think of when it comes to how do we use XR in an ethical way. Uh, but if you ever get confused, uh, or get, get overwhelmed, just remember this, accessibility is a human right. People with disabilities deserve to be first-class citizens of the metaverse, of first-class technology users, uh, and have access to the same tools and opportunities as able-bodied people, right? In the, the United States, we talk about the inal inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, and without accessibility, people with disabilities can lose some or all of those rights. Um, you know, there, there's been several times where uh, there's, you know, a hurricane or some other disaster and government officials release an evacuation map with no alternate text, right? And so in that case, people who are blind, who may arguably need more help in evacuating than folks who are able-bodied, they're kind of just left to die effectively. Um, so 
really keep in mind that accessibility is not just a nice to have, it is a right and it can be life or death. Um, so with that being said, I, I think most people, thankfully, uh, aren't eugenicists who believe that people with disabilities need to be cleansed from the bloodline or any of that terrible nonsense. Um, so if most people agree that accessibility is a good thing, why is the right to accessibility so frequently infringed on? Uh, and the answer is that we can't just legislate accessibility. We must also build it. Um, and that's that's really the difficult part. Discrimination against people with disabilities isn't just kind of a sign that we can change out when a law gets passed. It takes putting our money where our mouth is and building accessibility into our infrastructure. There's a scene in the movie uh, Hidden Figures from 2016. Uh, this is the, about Katherine Johnson, who's this brilliant black uh, mathematician at NASA, where her white boss gets so upset that she has to go all the way to the other side of the campus to use the colored ladies' bathroom uh, that he goes and rips down the bathroom signs with a crowbar and brings equality to NASA in one fell swoop. <laughs> um, but suppose that she was a wheelchair user and this building had no stairs that's not gonna be as easy to fix as just going ham with a crowbar. Um, we outlawed having you know, colored people entrances in the backs of buildings, but if you use a wheelchair and the ramp is in the back, that's pretty similar. Um, so the, the principles I wanna talk about here in terms of the, the ethics that we're, at least the portion of ethics we're gonna be focusing on today um, is number one, make your applications accessible. Number two, respect user privacy. Uh, and number three, enable representation. So on the first one, making your application accessible, um, obviously we've talked a lot about how to do that. So I just wanna add two things to that. Um, number one is this idea of progress over perfection. Um, every action you take to improve accessibility helps. Uh, don't worry about making it perfect and 100% accessible uh, right from the get-go, just try to bake in as much accessibility as you can uh, into your kind of MVP and come back later and, and make upgrades and improvements as you're able to, right? The more accessibility features you have, the more people will be able to use it. It's, it's very much uh, a sliding scale, not just a, a binary yes or no, this is accessible. Um, and the second thing I'll say here is I, I really shouldn't have to say this, but don't charge for accessibility features. There was a social VR platform that offered captions as a paid feature, um, which is really not, not good because accessibility needs to be something that's core, not a premium optional feature that you're, you're trying to monetize. Because um, apparently that, that needs saying. <laughs> Uh, the second principle here I want to talk about is this idea of respecting user privacy. Um, and now this is important for everyone, but especially for people with disabilities, because they might face discrimination from potential employers, from insurance providers, uh, from any number of folks if their, accessibility, if their disability is publicized. Um, and I bring up privacy here specifically because mm -hmm. There are some very tempting things that you can do with unlimited data, right? Think about an application for blind users that can recognize the face of anybody they need or preload a map of any building they enter to give them step-by-step -step directions. Now that would be an incredible accessibility tool, but you can probably guess that it would mean that the person using it is now a walking, talking recording device that Facebook or FBI or who knows who else can access. Uh, now that doesn't mean that we have to completely give up on tools like facial recognition. It just means that we have to be very careful with the data that we're gathering and the data that we're sharing. Um, so you could, for example, do a facial recognition app uh, in which the user teaches the device, the faces of the 10 people they see most frequently. And that information stays on the device and never leaves it. Uh, or you could set up environmental scanning for public places like airports or libraries, uh, but turn it off when you step into somebody's house. Let let you know the owner of a space control 
who gets access to the the map and the other details of their home or their their places. Um, and the other thing I'll say here is is don't forget that you should never force someone to disclose that they have a disability. Um, don't make an extra version of your app that's disability friendly because number one, I guarantee you it's not going to be updated as frequently as the main version. Uh, and number two, it might be possible to track who goes to which version uh, and therefore have a pretty good idea of, oh, so-and-so went to the blind-friendly version, they must be blind. Uh, and that is uh, just, again, not a privacy risk that you want to be taking on. Uh, and so then the final principle I'm going to talk about here is the idea of enabling representation. Uh, and this has uh, two, two aspects to it here. The first is representative avatars, right? Letting people choose how to represent themselves with or without a disability, because yeah. people in different contexts may want to share or may want to hide their disability. Um, so making sure that they have the option to represent themselves however they are, right? Whether that's with a wheelchair, with a hearing aid, thin, fat, limb differences, whatever, they should be able to have have agency there, um, and they should be able to to modulate how they appear in different places. Uh, and then the second half of this is supporting disabled creators. Um, again, really try to bring in folks with disabilities from day one uh, when it comes to your team, right? Uh, and also make sure that creator tools are accessible as well. You know, it's, it's great to have um, a end output that's accessible. But if the tools for creators aren't also accessible, then you're locking them out of the content creation process. Uh, and so it's it's really important when we think about ethics, when we think about our moral imperative to uh, keep these, these technologies equitable, uh, cool. it's important to think about both these things, both the way people represent themselves and the way that they are able to contribute to the development uh, of this technology um, that yeah, we just need to be need to be inclusive. So on that note, I'd like to, to stop again for another discussion. Uh, and let's talk briefly, how is ableism, which is discrimination against people with disabilities, how is ableism similar to or different from other forms of discrimination? Love to hear what the uh, what the class thinks. Yeah, absolutely. Anybody else have, have suggestions here? And I, I'd, I'd encourage you to think again about which aspects of discrimination uh, can be solved by changes in kind of behavior and which need to be solved in terms of changes to, to structure and, uh, and infrastructure. So not directly related to that question you just prompted us with, but I've noticed with, with ableism, much more than any other isms, there is a huge problem with sympathy rather than empathy. Um, if I share a disability, the response would be, I'm sorry and not, I understand. Uh, and you don't really see that in other isms. 
Yeah, that is very true. I mean, I think there's there's that instinct to to uh, say, I know, oh yes, that 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 must be terrible, right? Or to just just pity somebody uh, who is has a disability. Um, but from from everything I've read, the last thing that most people with disabilities want is pity. What they typically want is equality, independence, to be treated like a human being and not just kind of a a broken toy. Um, we we had some even problems at our last uh, XR Access Symposium. Somebody, one of our speakers, uh, used the term wheelchair bound uh, as opposed to to a wheelchair user, uh, and we had some folks in the audience that were upset with that because for folks with motor disabilities, they're not necessarily bound to their wheelchair. Their wheelchair is a tool that helps them do a heck of a lot more than they could without a wheelchair. Um, and so to, to take that and to flip it around and make it a negative um, is something that, that just kind of goes to show the way that, yeah, that ableism is really embedded in a lot of, a lot of our thinking. I think especially in the United States where we have this focus on rugged individualism um, that rather than taking a, a, a big scale approach to solving our problems. Um, yeah, no, that, that could be a big challenge. Anybody else have any other suggestions here? I'd say one really big difference is that how situational this could be, because like you said, if you break your arm, suddenly you now know you're now if you'll have access to your arms, or if you hate some sort of accident, you don't have to have or have to use crutches or sit in a wheelchair for a couple of weeks or months. You're now experiencing the same level of disability as someone who is in a wheelchair their entire life would experience, but only for a temporary amount of time. And it could happen to any individual in any circumstance almost. Yeah, no, that's true. I mean, I think a lot of us never experience what it's like to be disabled and therefore never have to to think about that, right? Although I will say one thing to, to be careful with here, um, a lot of the times VR are, is, is framed as like an empathy machine, right? You know, you can put it on and get an idea of what it's like to be a wheelchair user or blind or uh, what have you. Um, and I think that's something we have to be very careful with because there's a big difference between being blindfolded for 10 minutes and being blind. Um, and the the feelings that you know folks feel upon being you know temporarily disabled, right? Uh, that that panic you might feel if you first the first you know X time after losing your sight, that is not going to be the same experience as somebody who's been blind for years or for their whole life. Uh, who for them, it's just their way of being and they've developed all kinds of techniques and tools to to navigate that. Um, so I think be always be careful when uh, about kind of assuming that you know what an experience is like because you've had it for some you know limited amount of time. Again, goes to the, the need to have actual people with disabilities uh, and not just simulators or things of that nature. Um, awesome. Well, let's go ahead and go on to the next part. And I, I actually, before that, I see a question here from uh, Nathan saying, I was wondering if there is any research regarding the benefits or implications of connecting directly to the brain, brain computer interface, in order to meet, better meet the user's needs. Uh, could this help in AR? Um, it's a very good question. Uh, there is a company called Cognition, uh, spelled with an X, uh, so C-O-G-N-I-X-I-O-N, um, that has been working for a while now on a kind of augmented reality headset that's focused on communication for people with really severe physical disabilities. Um, and part of that includes using a BCI because for some folks that can't even, you know, move their eyes, that brain signal, that brain activity is still there. Um, so absolutely, there's, there's a big potential uh, in BCIs for, you know, especially for the folks with kind of the most disabling disabilities. Um, and I'm positive that once they've cracked that, uh, that it's going to result in all kinds of amazing interfaces for able-bodied folks as well. Um, awesome. So let's move on here because I know we're almost at the end. Uh, I just want to leave you guys with some XR accessibility resources. 
Uh, and I should note, first of all, that all of these are available um, on the XR Accessibility Project. Uh, this is something that XR Access and the XR Association have been collaborating on. Uh, it's kind of a one-stop shop for uh, accessible XR. Um, you can find it at xray.org slash GitHub, capital G, capital H. Uh, and it's going to have you know most of what we're looking at today. Um, the next one I want to suggest is the IEEE Global Initiative on the Ethics of Extended Reality. Um, this is a kind of interdisciplinary group uh, put together by IEEE as well as by Kent Bai, um, who, as I mentioned, is the Voices of VR uh, journalist. And it has reports on diversity, inclusion, and accessibility, on education, on trolling, harassment, online safety, um, anon anonymity and privacy, virtual clones and the right to your identity, uh, the metaverse and its governance, and a bunch more. Um, so if you want to, to consider more the ethics of these technologies, um, this, is, this is the place to go. Uh, if you don't want to read the reports, um, Ken also did a series of podcasts on Voices VR with the authors, uh, including myself, um, to make those a little easier to, to grok. So I encourage you to check that out. Um, and then the rest of these are kind of focused more on the, the kind of hacking angle, the, the for folks that want to, to jump in, get their hands dirty, and make accessible uh, XR products. Um, so the, the first thing I'll say here is a hacker's guide to XR accessibility. This is an article that I wrote for the MIT Reality Hack Hackathon. Um, and in it, uh, there's a definition of XR accessibility like we talked about today. Um, there's some potential user needs that haven't been met uh, and some hack suggestions. And of course, a number of hacking resources um, that I'll show you in this, uh, this uh, presentation as well. Um, so the next couple pages here are some very good uh, tools for just open source code. Um, a lot of these leverage uh, web XR, which is, um, I think, has a lot of benefits in terms of working on a large variety of devices, not having to have big installs, um, working with some of the, the framework of kind of HTML, which is very accessible. Um, so and could you check these out? Uh, there's A-Frame. Um, the Wonderland engine, uh, Babylon JS, um, React, uh, and Mozilla Hubs, all good places to start developing from. Um, there's also uh, some WebXR accessibility plugins and libraries that you can use. So for example, here we have, uh, and, and we'll make sure to share this presentation so you have all these links, um, but a, a graphical user interface with ARIA and tab order. ARIA is used for screen readers. Um, similarly, why ARIA integration, uh, more screen reader accessibility, accessibility tools for React 3 Fiber, um, selection-based interaction, which basically is keyboard support for a bunch of these. Uh, then moving through here, um, there's interaction plugins and libraries. Um, so VR components for leap motion, uh, hand tracking, more hand tracking, um, hand controllers, uh, teleportation tool, just a lot of, of really useful things. So you don't have to kind of build the wheel from scratch um, to, to mix my metaphors here. <laughs> and uh, finally, um, I think the last thing we have for A-Frame and WebXR here is uh, a couple more A-Frame examples. Uh, some of these were put together by uh, Roland Dubois, who's our, our, one of our accessible development of XR um, leaders at XR Access. So I encourage you to check them out. Uh, for Unity, there's also a few options. Um, uh, plugins and components that you can use, uh, UI accessibility plugin from Metal Pop Games, uh, more user, user GUIs from uh, Roundwise, text resizing, color blindness simulation. Uh, and then, of course, some of the ones we talked about in the presentation, uh, the walk-in VR driver. This can plug in on Steam and apply to, I believe, any Steam VR game. Um, Seeing VR, which is, again, a Unity plugin that has a lot of examples of how you'd make um, visual accessibility tools. Uh, and then there's just some kind of interesting products and, and prototypes out there. Um, some AR captioning demos. Uh, this one, I think, was just put out uh, somebody on LinkedIn. Uh, People Lens. This is a, a Microsoft project that's AI social support for blind children, helping them to, to kind of identify who's talking and, and maintain uh, kind of head orientation. Uh, there's the Conjure Facial Expression VR Controller. Um, it's a prototype that let you 
uh, you know, navigate using nothing but above your neck. Um, there's a 3D rudder foot motion controls. Um, you know, all of these different examples of ways that people are thinking about how to uh, provide access to these these um, to these technologies without necessarily what you expect is the the typical approach uh, to an interface. So, all that said, um, I encourage everybody to stay in touch. Uh, you can find more information about XR Access on our website, uh, xraccess.org. Um, you can email us at info at xraccess.org and uh, Slack. Join our Slack community at bit.ly. Uh, slash XR access dash slack. Um, also encourage you to reach out to me. Uh, I'm like I said, Dylan at drfoxdesign.com or, or just find me on LinkedIn. Uh, and yeah, wanted to, to thank everybody here for listening. Thanks uh, to Professor Han for having me. Uh, and uh, I don't know if we have any time for, for questions, but uh, thanks for thanks for coming. So I know we have at least two questions. Yeah. Three, well, right? <laughs> That's great. Yeah, come on up because it's a little hard to hear uh, everything in the background, anyhow. <laughs> Let's make a line. Right? Oh, sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Can you uh, get closer to the mic? The mic is like up here. Oh, okay, no wonder. Being here right now? Yes. Okay, so during development of an app or a, a tool, such as um, the one that you shown us, when do you, um, you say, okay, so this is a viable product where a um, wide range of, you know, a person with disabilities can use? What, when do you think, okay, well, this is... This is good enough. It's a really good question. Um, I think there's no hard and fast rule, right? Because uh, the again, the more features you add, the more accessible things get. Yeah. Um, one that I think is a big benchmark in web accessibility is having good focus order and screen reader accessibility, um, and then having good captions. Because if you have those two things, then Oftentimes that means it's going to be usable for people who are blind, usable for people that have kind of motor disabilities, uh, and usable for people who are deaf, um, at least insofar as those apply to your functionality, right? That That's just for kind of a, a an everyday website though. When it comes to XR, it's, it's tricky. I mean, I think trying to do some basic simulations of can I do this with one hand can I do this with, uh, you know, a color blindness or a low vision simulator on? Um, can I do this sitting down? Can I do this standing up? Uh, just, just trying to to run through some of those basic scenarios. Um, can I do this with no volume? Right. Think, think about things like that and see if you can pass some of those basic tests. I think it's a, a good kind of bench line for if you're really in that that hustle to get it out the door phase. Thank you so much. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, I'm going to try and stand in front of this camera. I'm taller, so I will be dynamic. Ah, uh, thank you. Um, I'm the one with the ridiculously loud voice who is researching accessibility. Um, I'm specifically looking at digital accessibility for um, neuroatypical students in computer science. So I've got a very narrow focus, but it relates a lot to web accessibility. You touched on uh, those poor guidelines from the web content accessibility guidelines. Mm -hmm. Is someone working on something similar for XR? Is there an organization like the Web Accessibility Initiative that's trying to put together those kind of guidelines? Yes. So there's uh, part one of the things on that XR accessibility project I listed is kind of all of the guidelines that we've gathered so far. 
Um, the W3C did put out kind of a prototype set of guidelines. So that's the XR accessibility user requirements. Um, that is kind of like the, the basics of like, don't give people simulator sickness, right? Make sure that your six degree of freedom stuff isn't the only way to use it, um, things like that. Uh, there's also uh, Meta has actually a pretty good set of guidelines. Um, there's another, uh, we use the game accessibility guidelines. So a lot of those are relevant to XR. Um, the XR Association has uh, the developer's guide with some, not like a comprehensive list, but some good things you can do. So the short answer is yes, there's many of them. There's none that is yet officially the canon core, this is how you make it accessible. Um, but definitely encourage you to, to, to check it out and, uh, and, and join the Slack because I'd be really interested to hear about your research. All right, so kind of one last and then I'm going to totally give it up. If you had to pick one, which one would you pick of those guidelines that you mentioned? Oh, the guidelines? Ooh. Yeah. Uh, well, you said what? This is for which project? So um, really, you had mentioned all the different people working on these guidelines, these potential overarching guidelines. You personally, putting you on the spot, if you had to pick one, which one would you pick? Mm. I know, I'm so mean. I know, I know. I think the the one, if I had to use one that's relatively comprehensive, probably the Oculus designing accessible VR experiences, uh, mm -hmm. because I think those are pretty well fleshed out and they capture that, that kind of essence of if you want to make something accessible to the broadest number of people possible, here are some kind of very good basic design guidelines you can do to, to do that. Um, so I, I'd probably give it to them. There's some others that uh, get, get much deeper into certain things, but that's a good overall preview. Thank you. Absolutely. Oh, sorry, what was your name? I'd, I'd love to stay in touch. Am I in there? there? I'm Erin. Um, I'm going to email you like as soon as class is over. So we'll talk. Great, great. Hello. All right. I have a question regarding awards and accessibility because I know Ooh. I guess I want to get your opinion on that. There should mm -hmm. even be awards and accessibility or if there should be more. Because I know for things like the game awards, they have a category for innovation and accessibility. And for someone mm -hmm. who isn't involved in accessibility that much, it's very interesting to see that displayed and I guess get more attention on categories like that. Do you think there should be more awards for that? Or do you think having awards in general is bad because it kind of, I guess, well, I, want, I think on one hand it incentivizes accessibility, but it also kind of I don't know the word for it, but I guess it gives the wrong reason to incorporate accessibility in the projects. Sure, sure. Uh, let me put it like this. I think accessibility awards do more good than they do harm. Uh, I think shining a spotlight on accessibility is, at the moment, a very good thing. I would love to live in the world where accessibility is unremarkable because it's just assumed to be a part of everything. Um, and I, I think the, the the tricky part with awards is I remember there was uh, an a Academy Award recently for uh, CODA, right? Children of Deaf Adults. Um, and they made sure to do that portion of the Academy Awards with sign language interpretation. Um, and that's great, but why isn't there sign language interpretation for the rest of it, right? There's, I think this idea sometimes that the only people that care uh, are, not the only either the only people that care about accessibility are those who are disabilities or that people with disabilities only care about things related to accessibility right um and so i think we want to make sure that yes we celebrate you know breakthroughs in accessibility um there's groups like uh, naughty dog last of us part two that had so many innovations in making a, a 3d first person shooter accessible that that absolutely deserves celebration um but yeah, I think you want to take that with that grain of salt that we shouldn't have to make awards for this. It should be just expected. Um, but alas, that is not yet the world that we live in. So in the meantime, the more attention, the better. Yeah, awesome. Thank you very much. Certainly.